So welcome to the new electronics diagnostics and repair course. During this course, I'm going to go through with you how to use all the equipment you need, starting with a multimeter, uh, how to diagnose and find problems on hardware, primarily retro gaming, obviously, because we do a lot of retro gaming, but this knowledge applies to all avenues and all areas of kind of hardware, board level repair and diagnostics. So we have a really good, active and growing Discord channel with over a thousand members now and on its way to 2000 members. On there, we help a lot of people and we'll say things like, you know, check for continuity with your battery, check the fuse, uh, check if you've got voltage at this point, all basic electronic terms. But if you're first getting into electronics and repairing, these terms are still foreign to you and you need to understand, you know, what I'd call the basics of diagnostics and repair. So through this series, this is going to be the introductory series that gets you familiar with bench power supplies, oscilloscopes, multimeters, all different tools that you can use to help diagnose. And I'm going to show you how I would look at a board that doesn't work and where I would think and what tools I would use first. Uh, but to begin with, we're going to start with just getting you familiar with the tools at hand, what certain terms mean and how we can use them. So let's just jump right in and let's take a look at this multimeter. You don't need one this expensive. Uh, we sell good ones. So we have obviously very expensive equipment because we do professionally. But I also buy the cheapest to the mid-range to the dearest of every product, physically use them every day, and find you guys the best ones you can use. So we do sell a good mid-range multimeter that isn't cheap and isn't over expensive, but if you do want to just buy yourself one and you're serious, then definitely go with a fluke without any shadow of a doubt. So let's just jump in and see how we use this multimeter. So every multimeter will be different. Um, you'll generally have a dial, that's kind of a common feature. Most dials will simply have an off in the left or right area. Uh, some won't have all these features, you'll just get at least resistance, continuity, um, voltage, amps is sometimes there, sometimes not. But either way, don't worry too much about all these for now, you only need to know how to turn a dial. So in this case, this doesn't have an off and then a position, this has an on off button, which is not the most common thing. So obviously to turn this multimeter on, you'd press the on and off button. So if we just turn this one on, and once it's loaded, we're presented with a screen. So don't worry about what's going on here first, let's just take a look at what we want to do first. So at the bottom, you want to make sure you've got your probe leads attached. So these are two leads, they normally come red and black, or pretty much should always come red and black. Black is typically where you'd probe your ground or negative side and red is where you'd probe your positive side if you're doing kind of voltage measurements. So we take these out first. You'll see the leads come, sometimes with a bung in the end here that you have to remove before you can fit them in. And see all these channels here? Some multimeters will just have two and you don't need to worry about them. Pretty much all meters will only have one um, black port and you can see all the lines going to this port. So that's the common one for black and it's also labeled common. So put the black probe lead in the black. And your next question, if you've got a multimeter like this and it isn't blatantly obvious, you'll normally have two things. One will be voltage, and you can see here voltage, and it's also telling you a hint that this is for diode readings, capacitors, resistance, all things like that. But basically, you normally have a voltage one and potentially an amp one. So the amp one's almost only ever used for when you want to read currents. So amps, milliamps, microamps, uh, all these here. So it's not common that you'd be in these connectors. I'll show you how to do current readings another time. But if you see anything like fused, um, then it's typically the amperage side. If you see more voltage ratings, you know it's voltage side. So for 99% of what you'll do with a multimeter, the red will go in the voltage side. So now we have the probes in, we can do something with this multimeter. So I'd say let's just start with the most common thing we do on any board and the main purpose I use multimeters for and it's not actually voltage reading, it's gonna be continuity. I'll also explain basics about electronics in another course, so you can learn what you know resistance is, voltage is, how we do ohms, wattage, what all these values mean. But continuity is a check of resistance. So if we turn this multimeter here to, this is the sign for ohms, so this is normally your resistance mode. So if we say measure the resistance, you turn your multimeter to this resistance mode. If we say check for continuity, all continuity means 
is that you have a really low resistance. So it's like a physical piece of wire. It, there should be, everything has resistance in it, but generally speaking, wire, for example, is really, really low resistance. So it'll be like zero ohms. The higher the resistance, the higher the number, the less current can flow through the wire. So don't get bogged down too much by detail for now, and let's focus on using the tool. But this symbol is to measure resistance, and we'll say things like, you know, is it measuring 1K, 10K, 4.7K? This means, when we say K, it means 1,000. So 4.7K means 4,700 ohms. Um, if you just say, like, does it measure 100 ohms, that just means 100. So 100 is 100. 4.7K is 4,700. 1M, for example, is 1 million. So you'll get used to all these terms, but basically the resistance is the higher the resistance, the higher the number. Continuity, which is your typical beep that you will hear on many videos and people doing it and saying they have continuity. All continuity does is measure the resistance, but if the resistance is less than typically around 50 ohms, you'll get a beep. So at the minute I'm in continuity mode here, and you can see it actually shows on this meter the actual current range. So if I touch them, you can see it shows the resistance is uh, 0.2, like 0.1 ohms resistance. So this is a good way to check if things on a circuit board are physically connected. This is how you check if a fuse is blown, because a fuse is just a device with a thin wire in, typically anyway, uh, that blows when too much current flows through. So then it physically breaks and there's no more wire. So when you check in between two points and there's no wire there, this will do this, open short, there's nothing there. If you touch and the fuse is good, you'll get a beep. The important thing to note about continuity mode is a beep doesn't mean it's connected. A beep means the resistance is less than a certain value. And typically that value is about 50 ohms. So if you want sometimes true readings, you can swap to resistance mode. And again, because this dial has three modes in one, it's common where you get sort of one mode and two modes together. Depending on your... Um, Multimeter, you'd normally just have, say, one colored in yellow and the other white, and then you'd have a yellow button somewhere that you press to change between modes. Because this is a slightly more advanced one, you can see I'm in resistance mode here, but I have a button here that corresponds to these four on a menu. And if I press this, it changes to continuity mode, and this now shows resistance, which is to go back to resistance mode. So I'm in continuity here. So let's just start with the continuity. You'd always want to check your probe meters like this to make sure that everything's set up and connected correctly. And then let's say with a Game Boy Advanced, what's the first thing you normally diagnose on most retro consoles? Uh, it's a blown fuse normally, or bad power getting into the system, so battery springs corroded. Basically what you're checking for at the very start is power flow. You know, are you getting your voltage into your system? Uh, but before you get voltage, or depending on which way around you want to do it, uh, you want to check if fuses are blown. I can already see on this board, for example, the fuse has actually been bridged, so it's bypassed. So I'll just grab another one with an actual fuse on. And we have one here. You can see this has been gutted up here. This is just a, a board in for repair. Uh, but you can see down here there is a fuse. So let's say I ask you to check a fuse on a console. Uh, you've come to our Discord, you want some assistance. You say you're getting no power, nothing's working. What's the first steps? So pretty much the first steps would be the really obvious. Are you getting continuity? Do you have a blown fuse? Um, check your power switch, things like that. It all revolves around checking physical connections to make sure they're not broken. So we can see here clearly the circuit won't work because there's things missing, there'll be broken circuits and traces to where things should go. But let's just start with the fuse and see if this fuse is good. So in continuity mode, the leads don't matter which way around they are because there's no kind of polarity to what we're doing. All we're doing is testing if these two ends are physically joined with low resistance. So when you do voltage, you typically have your black wire being on the least negative side. Um, but in terms of continuity and resistance, the, the leads don't matter which way around they are. They work both ways. So the first thing to do is identify the fuse. So in this case, here's the fuse, F1. You'll normally find that the designated F for fuses. Capacitors are normally C, as you can see, C43, CP1. Uh, diodes are normally D, hence DA1. Resistors are normally R. So you can see, you can kind of look around a circuit and go, I wonder what, say, this component is. Uh, there's a few hints. Uh, one is the color. Most capacitors that are surface mount are normally this brownish color. Most resistors are normally black on the top, like this. Not all the time, but it's a good indicator straight away that caps stand out as being brown. 
resistors stand out as being black. Um, the additional thing is you'll see obviously the silk screen here indicating and pointing that this is a capacitor with C26. So we've identified the fuse down here and we want to check if that fuse is working. So if we touch on one side of the fuse here and the other side with the leads, you can see we're getting a beep, which means that fuse is connected between here and here. So that's a good fuse. Now, this isn't necessarily a good fuse, as most people would think, uh, because we've tested continuity. Because if you remember, if you know a little bit about the electronics and the job of the fuse, the fuse is to prevent too much current flowing into the system. So it's to prevent, say, more than an amp or an amp and a half roughly flowing from the battery into your console in case there's a problem. All continuity is doing is checking do we have a physical low resistance between two things. But the job of the fuse isn't just to have low resistance, it's to be able to pass a certain amount of current. So if this fuse was on the way to blowing, and it was really, really, really thin wire, it would still have continuity, but would only be capable of passing a small amount of current. So doing this to test a fuse, although 90% of the time it's correct, don't always absolutely rely on it. Another check we can do uh, is we'll say, do you have ground? So we'll normally say, do you have ground to... Um, I don't know, for example, let's just say the battery switch cage for no reason. Or more practically, do you have ground to the trigger? So up here, the way the triggers work is they short a pin on the CPU to ground. So if I come and say, oh, check, do you have, is the continuity between the triggers ground? Well, in order to check to ground, we need to know where ground is. So ground on most circuit boards is usually, you can, you can start at the input of the power, which is the battery negative here. So we know this should be ground. If you're unsure where ground is, most circuits you'll have um, a lot of exposed copper like this and this. You'll have cages like this where um, things are attached. For most designs, those things are joined together and it's a good indicator that you have ground. It's not always rock solid, but pretty much if a cage on a system is grounded, it's a very good indicator you're on a good ground. The best place obviously is to correctly identify where it comes in by following it back to the input source that provides a ground reference. So we know this is ground because it's the battery's negative spring. We know that for a fact. So we have ground here. So what I do for ground to normally prove I have ground is just go around and tap like say the, the metal cages of uh, things connected to the circuit. And that's normally where you'll find that you have uh, ground points. If I flip over, this is still the battery. It's just where it's soldered the other side of the board. So we still have ground here. And I'll tap, say, the cage of the trigger here, because that's a metal cage. So that's how I'd prove I've kind of got a good ground first. So I know I'm testing two ground. So now, if I said, is this trigger, uh, does it have continuity to ground? You'd put one lead on the actual ground, and you'd check whichever side should be ground. And in this case, it's obviously the right side. The left side is the thing that should go to ground when you press the button. So you can see it does when I can press it with one hand. So that's how you test, in this case, if that physical switch here is working. So what we just did there was tested if this connection here, where the battery comes in, physically makes its way all the way up to this top right pad. And because it beeps, it does. So we have, and you can see how, because it's intermittently beeping, you want a solid beep, um, but because this has like solder flux on, um, so you can see like the uh, sort of the yellow crust there, if we crack it off, that's like the flux residue left off from soldering. That will not help with getting a good connection through to the metal underneath. So you sometimes have to push your probes in or just scrape a little to make sure you're making good contact. So we've proven with continuity mode that we have connection to here then to test if this physical button's working, and notice I'm saying physical button as well, I'm not nece necessarily saying that the left trigger on the GBA will work, because if we are testing this pad to this pad, all we're testing is that this physical button inside joins these two pins together. The rest of the circuit's important that if this side isn't grounded, like we've checked, it won't work, and if the other side that comes out, that goes through a few different components, uh, and doesn't make its way to the CPU, you still won't have it working. So just checking, for example, 
oh, I've said the triggers work because I have continuity and it goes to ground. That doesn't mean that the trigger's fully working. There's more to diagnose. But in terms of just sticking to testing for continuity, this is the perfect example where you can test over the switch like this and press. And that's checking the switch is working because the switch just presses a piece of metal down that joins these two together. So the first check of your button is working is to do that. So don't go swapping your trigger button if your console isn't registering a trigger press, if you haven't done the most basic check first and seen if this button's working. If this is beeping out, your button is absolutely fine. Do not replace it. So that's why I like to diagnose things properly instead of just blindly replacing things. There's many more things we can do with continuity, and we will do, but hopefully this gives you the first little introduction in how to use um, a multimeter and what you do to get to the modes, what they mean. Um, and we'll cover most of these and what they're used for as we go, as well as many other tools. And the aim of this course is to allow you to be able to diagnose problems, not just blindly replace items and guess things. Before we go and replace things on a board, it might be cheaper to just go and blindly swap things in terms of your labor time. The importance is to build your knowledge so you're capable of saying with confidence, I don't need to replace this button, it's working. Not, oh, it's not working in game, it's probably this button. Going off assumptions is what so many people online do and so many tutorials and guides and help and assistance is almost useless because it's based on no knowledge. It's based on somebody had this problem before, so therefore let's do this same action and hope for the best result. Now it works sometimes because you'll have common issues, um, but this isn't about helping you fix the boards. It's about helping you gain real knowledge that allows you to diagnose and then repair afterwards. So let's focus on understanding what we're doing and being able to confidently say how things work. We'll use probably the Game Boys and Game Gears as good examples, but you might find me working on completely different projects just to show off how you use certain tools. Next up, we'll probably take a look at resistance or voltage and check some of these resistors out and show you how to measure those. We'll take a stock console that doesn't work, open it up and use the knowledge we already have to put it into practice to find the problem. You can follow along with it and I will explain how I'm thinking and how I'm diagnosing a board from not working to working. So there'll be a lot of practical and real world examples going forward that help you understand how things work. If you have any more questions, do feel free to jump on our Discord. We have an active community of people that do board level repair and diagnostics, and we're all building this knowledge together. So if you want to get involved with a thriving community and really dive into this series, I'd recommend jumping on the Discord and following along there too. I hope you enjoyed this little introduction, and I'll see you in the next one.